So just a quick introduction. So welcome everyone to the mock paper review. Uh, the O-level tutors spent quite a bit of time to, to get this um, session up and running. Uh, took us some time to design the papers as well because we want to design something that we can as closely as possible mirror what you'll be expecting at O-levels. And hopefully by going through all of this, okay, uh, all the questions, the more difficult concepts, you'll be better prepared and really in our effort to help you take the next step towards your O-levels. Okay, so a little bit more about ourselves. Okay, so uh, who are we? Uh, we are a team of uh, tutors, but I think more importantly, what we're trying to achieve with our platform at Overmarked here is to really build something that students need uh, in a form of personal development or even academic excellence, right? So how do you excel in life? You know, how do you uh, do well in school? And more importantly, how do you develop a strong character? So having been through the education system ourselves, we really know how tough it can get, right? No jokes, it is a grind. But I think what we're trying to do here is to offer you a helping hand to just make your life a little bit easier in any way that, that we can, like, if possible. Okay, so a bit more about myself. I'm Daryl. Uh, if you're new to the platform, uh, hi. If you're here for quite a while, okay, you should have seen my face at least once. Like, okay, so I'm actually a specialist tutor in O-level chemistry and physics. <laughs> So I only do these two topics um, and I think for myself, I've been tutoring for quite a while, working with a lot of students, all, all, all ranges of students from students that are doing very well and students that are struggling. But I think something that I see in common uh, are some of the things I'm about to share later on in terms of the best uh, practices, in terms of what you should be looking out for when you're doing these two key science subjects. Uh, I do both private and group tuition. So I have a a couple of group tuitions that are going to be entering O level soon. Pretty worried, but uh, I think uh, my worry is like uh, the same for everybody else uh, to all O level students that are taking uh, their exam this year. Okay, so how would today's session be structured? Okay, firstly, we'll do an overview of the paper. So I'm just going to bring you through roughly how the paper flow, what you should be thinking about when you see the paper. Then we're going to go through the MCQ first. So 40 questions. Some questions I'll go fast, the more difficult questions I'll slow down. Then we'll take a break in the middle portion before we move on to the paper two. Then I'll just share briefly about uh, moving forward, right? Six to seven weeks away from our O level. Uh, what should you be thinking about? How should your revision timeline be like? Uh, before moving on to talk about the impact of removing common last topic, right? No, no, again, can show, right? But I'm going to tell you how it impacts the rest of your paper. And at the end, we'll have a short Q&A section. Okay, so during this session, you can feel free to ask me any questions uh, related to the paper, related to chemistry or school. Okay, anything you'd like to ask me, that's the chance to do so. Okay, meanwhile, throughout the lesson, uh, if you have questions, you can put it in the chat. Uh, but for the benefit of everyone, I think uh, I will just go through the paper as the key focus. Okay, so if not, uh, I'll get everybody to go over to the Telegram channel, download the paper with the answers, okay? If you've already printed out the mock paper and you want to do corrections on it, I think that's fine as well, okay? Let's jump straight into it. We have quite a bit of content to go through. Okay, so let's start off with talking about the MCQ paper. So the general advice that I give all students is that when you receive the MCQ paper, and you know they usually ask you to check for all pages, right? what you should be doing is to get a time to browse through all the questions to sort of identify what uh, topics are being tested at which portions. What you want to do is to ensure that you allocate sufficient time for you to complete the entire paper comfortably. Okay? So if you take a general scan at the paper, okay, you'll notice that there are certain structures, okay, uh, specifically in the middle portion here at chapter uh, question 9, 10, 11, where more concepts starts appearing. You'll want to prepare to spend more time in these portions. Okay? Uh, follow on moving into electrolysis, which is typically a little more complicated. So you want to have more time here. And as you scroll down further, okay, you'll notice that the questions on rate of reaction, Haber process, and metal start appearing. Um, so one tip that I always give my student is, for example, if you take a look at question 25, they're asking about trends, right? Trends in your group seven. So for this kind of questions, right? If you are worried that you might forget, right? Because if you memorize very hard before your exam, uh, I know the reactivity decrease, melting boiling point increase, things like that. You might want to attempt these questions first before your memory get rusty. So I'm talking about pure memorization, regurgitation sort of stuff, right? You might want to attempt those questions straight up, okay? Before the start of the paper, in case you forget it midway through, okay? But if you're super smart, you get everything in the back, then I think life is a lot easier, okay? Same for question 30, this is about memorizing content. So you might want to attempt these questions first. 
Okay. If not, as you scroll down further, you notice that, okay, the, the pot back half here, you notice that I set you question 40, but the truth is that for your actual O-level exam, right, your questions will be removed, which means maybe somewhere along from 35 to 36 to 40, those are typically your organic chem questions. Those are your common last topic removed. So actually, you have slightly more time uh, than this paper that we set, but I wanted to give you all the bulk of the practice. So I set as much questions as possible. Okay, so this is the overview the, for the paper. If you tried it, okay, and you're wondering, is this more or less difficult than O-level? I'll say this is supposed to be slightly more difficult than your O-level. But I think it shouldn't be much more difficult than your prelim papers, okay? So without further ado, let's look through this um, paper and look at the key learning points, okay? Uh, feel free to take down as much notes as you want, okay? I'll be writing it on screen as well as sharing it uh, via my explanation, okay? Now, question one, right? So first thing first, whenever we approach a question, we have to take a look and identify what's the concept being tested here. So what is being tested here, okay, is the collection of gas, specifically under chapter 1.1 under experimental design. So here in experimental design, what we have learned is that there are different ways to collect gases, okay, as well as different ways to dry your gases. So if we go back to the rule here, we take a look. Gas X is insoluble in water, while gas Y is soluble in water. What does this mean? If gas X is insoluble in water, it can be collected via displacement of water. Guess why cannot? Why not? Because guess why would dissolve in water if that's the case, right? Okay. Now, both gas have MR greater than 40. What's the, what's the meaning of this and why is this important? We need to know that air is made out of around 78% nitrogen and around 21% oxygen. So if you go and calculate the average mass of air, right, it will be roughly somewhere along the lines of um, around 29. So when you're comparing the gas MR, with the MR of air, which is around 29. What this means is that both gases are heavier or denser than air. So when you're considering whether to use upward or downward delivery, okay, your key consideration should be, is it denser or less dense? If it's heavier, which means it's denser than air, okay, we should be using down downward delivery, which is why the answer here should be Okay, so pretty underrated question, okay, for you to really understand why are you doing a certain method here, okay, that's the reason why you, you're doing so, okay. If not, let's move on to question two. So this one would bring us back to our understanding of element, compounds, and mixture. Okay, one thing I'd like to remind you all is that air is a mixture of gases, okay. So when we say air, we know that inside air, there's nitrogen, there's oxygen, there's carbon dioxide, and a whole lot of nonsense, right? So Make sure you remember that, okay? So air is neither an element or nor a compound. It is a mixture, which is why the answer here should be B. Okay, question three, okay? So here we have a couple of substances. We see the melting and boiling point. What you want to remember is that between the melting and the boiling point, this range of temperature is when it is in liquid state. Okay, so let's look at the statement one by one and check through whether this is correct or wrong. Okay, now, substance W is a volatile compound. When we say volatile, what does it mean? Volatile means it easily turns from liquid to gas. The best way to think of something that's volatile is your perfume, right? The moment you spray out, the liquid turn into gas. Okay, so what makes something volatile? If the boiling point is low or close to room temperature, it is very volatile. Why? It's because the moment the liquid is exposed to your room temperature, it evaporates and it boils and turns into a gas. Okay, so how this works is that when you take a look at your volatility, you need to look at the boiling point. Do you notice that the boiling point here is 23.5, right? So what this implies is that a boiling point is low, likely W is a very volatile compound. So this statement, true. Okay. Substance X exists as a gas at room temperature. Yes, because at negative 36, it has already went past the boiling point to turn into a gas. So at room temperature and pressure, it's already existing as a gas. Substance Y exists as a solid. This is true because at room temperature and pressure, it hasn't passed its melting point. So it's still in solid state. Haven't melt yet. Okay, so this is true as well. Substance Z is likely to exist as a diatomic molecule. 
So diatomic molecule largely are used to refer to gas. Okay, so substance Z here, can you see, is existing as a gas at room temperature and pressure. So likely it's one of your N2, uh, O2, or H2. Okay, any of this gas. Okay, so is it likely? Yes, it's likely. So this is true as well. Okay, so all of the above are true. Okay, so a very simple question with regards to melting and boiling, but I think just as important for you to understand, okay, how this works. If you think I'm going too fast, it's because we got 40 questions to cover. So I, on average, got one minute per question. Okay, now to do this question properly, take note here, we are dealing with the ion version. Okay, so if you check your periodic table, okay, not B, E, R, B, sorry. Uh, it, is, it has five proton and six neutron. But because it is 3 plus, so what it meant is that it gave away 3 electrons. So a B3 plus ion should have 5 proton, 6 neutron, and 2 electron. So which statement is true? D is true. Okay, so take note, in the exam, you've got to be super careful. Are they dealing with the atom or are they dealing with the ion? What it means, right, the difference is that for ions, the electrons have escaped or they gave away or took in electrons. That's why it has a certain charge. So you want to be very careful when we're dealing with ions, okay? Next, question five. Which compound have both ionic and covalent bond? Okay, if you're on your paper, put an asterisk here, because this is actually quite a commonly tested question. Not too sure whether it came out in your prelim, but I think there's a good chance, okay, that you have seen this question before. Now, you want to know that within NO3 minus, okay, within this compound itself, is actually a lot of covalent bond. Okay, uh, for the questions, right, I'll try to answer y'all later during the break, okay? Let me go through the main paper, but feel free to type it in the chat, okay? Now, within NO3, right, because it's between non-metals, okay, this should be a covalent bond. Now, but between the sodium and the nitrate, it is a Na plus and a NO3 minus. So do you notice the charges here? What exists between the two, is a strong electrostatic force of attraction. So between Na plus and NO3 minus, it is an ionic bond. But within NO3, it is covalent bond. This is the reason why your sodium nitrate contains both ionic and covalent bonds. Okay, so I repeat again, uh, between Na and NO3 is ionic, within NO3 is a covalent bond. Okay, so take note of that. Uh, shouldn't the answer be C? Uh, yeah, 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 correct, correct. Sorry, sometimes when I'm doing this, I'm sleeping. So good for everybody, yeah, sodium nitrate. Yes, answer is C, good job, okay? So make sure you go and do that. Uh, I'll upload uh, edited version later, okay? But good, paying attention, very good, okay? Now, let's take a look at question six. So for question six, we learned graphite before. We know certain properties related to graphite, okay? So what are the few that we need to know about graphite? Okay, for those of you that are wondering what is this document that I'm scrolling through, it's just a curated note. So uh, for those that already came for the crash course or purchased a copy, uh, you'll notice that this is exactly what is being shown. Like. So you can refer to your curated notes as well. Uh, this is for the benefit of those that haven't gotten the curated notes. Okay, now uh, certain properties we need to know about graphite is that firstly, the graphite layers, okay, the bonding here, the force here is very weak. So they can easily slide past one another. Okay, unlike most covalent compound, okay, the graphite is actually able to conduct electricity because the fourth electron is delocalized. So these are some of the things that we already know about graphite. Now, going back to this question, here, this is not graphite. This is graphene, right? So what is graphene? Graphene is exactly like graphite. It's just that instead of the fourth electron being delocalized, the fourth, fourth electron is caught in a bonding with a hydrogen atom. So in general, it behaves everything the same as graphite. The only difference is that it doesn't have a fourth delocalized electron. And how does it affect the question? If you take a look here, will it be able to conduct electricity in solid state? It can no longer do so. Why? It's because the fourth electron is no longer delocalized, okay? It is not able to conduct electricity. It will still have high melting boiling point. It can still slide over one another easily. It is not simple molecular structure. It should be giant covalent structure. Therefore, answer should be C. Okay, so this is uh, how we would uh, take a look at question six. Okay, uh, I think it's quite interesting. And I think I've seen it before in prelim papers as well. So do take note. Okay, question seven here, we see the periodic table. Okay, uh, I'll be straightforward with this. Uh. 
if you are taking a look at an ionic compound, it has to be between a metal and a non-metal, right? So if we are taking a look at A and C, we confirm that this is between metal and non-metal, okay? And A is in group one, while C is in group six. So how would the bonding be like? You need two of A and one of C, which is why the answer here is B. Okay, clear? So ionic or covalent depends, is it metal, non-metal, or non-metal, non-metal? Okay, metal, non-metal is ionic. Non-metal, non-metal is covalent, all right? Then if not, let's take a look at question eight. So question eight, once again, this is our giant covalent compound, okay? This is silicon dioxide. This is one of the most commonly made mistakes. When we see silicon dioxide, okay, we think that one silicon atom is bonded to two oxygen. Is this true or false? Okay, the answer here is that this is actually not true. Okay, so if you take a look at the properties of a silicon dioxide, do you notice here that each silicon is actually covalently bonded to four oxygen atoms? Then each oxygen is bonded to two silicon atoms. So the reason why it's called silicon dioxide is because the ratio of silicon to oxygen is one is to two. But each silicon is actually bonded to four oxygen atoms, while each oxygen atom is bonded to two silicon. Okay, so if we go back to the question, can you see why is it a bit tricky? Here, option A is trying to trick you. It's trying to tell you, okay, one atom bonded to two. Sounds about right, right? SiO2. But if you take a look at the diagram, that is not true. One silicon, can you see? Oxygen one, two, three, four. It's actually bonded to four oxygen. So statement A is actually factually not correct. Okay. Meanwhile, if you want to take a look at why is it called SiO2, it's because of the ratio between silicon and oxygen. So if you are studying okay, this chapter, you want to be very precise in terms of how you understand okay, uh, how this works. Okay? And I think from there, silicon dioxide will make it a lot clearer. Quick question. Do you all know when else does silicon dioxide appear in our syllabus? Okay, nobody's going to answer me, so I'll answer myself. Okay? The answer here is that it will appear in blast funnels, all right? So we'll come to that later, but blast funnels in terms of how your calcium oxide remove your silicon dioxide to form Casio, your slick, okay? So we'll come back to this in a moment. Okay, now, um, what I'd like to highlight here for question 9 and 10 and 11 is that these are more concept questions, okay? But more importantly, uh, I've always preached the importance of following through with the steps when we are doing more concept. So starting from the first step, writing out your balance equation, Step two, calculating more. Step three, comparing more ratio. And step four, calculating what the question is asking you for. So take note that this question is a question about percentage purity. So what we're trying to find here is the mass of the pure substance. Okay. So whenever we're doing more concept question, you need to be very careful because percentage U and percentage purity is different, right? So when we're calculating percentage U, what our calculation would give us is the theoretical U. Okay. Meanwhile, if you're attempting a question on pure sub, uh, percentage purity, whatever you're calculating using your four steps, okay, would give you the mass of your pure substance. So there's a slight difference here. One of it gives you a numerator, one of it gives you the denominator. So if we go back to this question here, the question is asking us about percentage purity. Percentage purity, what I'm calculating is actually the mass of the pure substance. Then what happens after that? What happens after that is that the question here, can you see 100 grams? They'll give you the mass of the substance. So whatever I calculate here, which is 25, okay, it's supposed to go over my total mass. Okay, I think there's a bit of calculation error. I think it's supposed to be 100. So answer should be 25%. Okay, so answer should be A here. Okay, but I think the, the calculations, they, are, they still stay, okay, in terms of the steps, okay? It's just a take note because this is 100 grams. Okay, wait, now let me double check. Okay, oh, wait, wait, wait. I think I changed the value. That's why it's a bit confusing. Wait, ah. Okay, I think the correct answer is still B. Uh, sorry for a moment, ah. I correct the working here. Because here is 12, right? This is supposed to be 12, right? 12 divided by 24, 0 0.5. So this is 0 0.5, this is 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 50 grams, 
50 over 100. Yeah, answer is still B, okay? Uh, but just take note of the changes. Uh, don't be too worried. I'll go and correct this and upload the correct copy afterwards, okay? But the key learning point here is that if the question doesn't give you a chemical equation, you should write up the chemical equation yourself, okay? Then obviously calculate according to the question, compare more ratio and solve it, okay? Next, question 10. Okay, so in question 10, okay, what's happening here is that we see sulfur dioxide reacting with oxygen to form sulfur trioxide. Once again, if you're coming to a more concept question, if the question doesn't give you a chemical equation, you write it out yourself, okay? So here we see sulfur dioxide reacting with oxygen to give sulfur trioxide, okay? Even though we have 3 dm cube of sulfur dioxide reacting with 2 dm cube of oxygen, take note that not all of it will react. Why do I say so? You need to remember that in more concept, we have to consider what is limiting and what is in excess. Okay, Why is this important? It's because when we are doing this question, if you take a look, the more ratio between SO2 and O2 is actually 2 is to 1. What's, what's the importance of this? It means that for every 2 moles of SO2, it reacts with 1 mole of oxygen. So 3 dm cube of sulfur dioxide it will only react with 1.5 dm cube of oxygen. Meanwhile, I have 2 dm cube of oxygen. So what happens here? It means that after reaction, I will still have excess of 0 0.5 dm cube of oxygen. So I got too much oxygen. Meanwhile, more ratio is 2 is to 1 is to 2. I'll produce, two, um, I'll produce a ratio of 2 for SO3. So when I react 3 with 1.5, I will get 3 dm cube of SO3 as well. Okay, so the question here is asking us for the volume of remaining gas. So we need to account for the gas that I've produced as well as the excess gas. So I have 3 dm cube of SO3. I have 0 0.5 dm cube in excess of oxygen. So my volume of my remaining gas should be 3.5. Clear? So when you see a similar question, right, the first thing that should come to your mind is, okay, I need to take note of my limiting and my excess. Then from there, the question in terms of volume of remaining gas will make a lot more sense. Okay, so that's for question 10. Question 11 is a basic balancing equation. So I won't go through this, okay, you just need to balance the equation basically, okay? So for question 12, this is about neutralization. So same thing, you just need to con uh, create your equation and then you do your balancing. So take note here, sulfur dioxide is H2SO4. Potassium hydroxide is KOH. So what you want to remember here is, do you see that H2SO4 when dissolved in water, it produces 2H+. This is known as dibasic, which means produce 2H+. Meanwhile, KOH only produce 1OH-. This is known as monobasic. Okay, so what? how does these two interact? If you want them to neutralize each other and you're forming a balanced equation, one mole of H2SO4 would react with two moles of KOH. So the mole ratio is one is to two. Okay, So I won't spend the time to go through the working itself, uh, but this is something that I think you want to look out for. So if we were to do this quickly, uh, how much sulfuric acid is needed to neutralize? 25 cm cube of one mole. Okay? So if you take 25, over 1,000 times 1, okay, that value here that you get, you need to divide it by 2 because the mole ratio of H2SO4 to KOH is 2 is to 1. So the number of mole of H2SO4 needed is half of that of KOH. Then you just go and find, okay, which value will give you that exactly, okay? And you should check that actually C will be able to give you the correct value there. Okay, so this is a question about understanding the importance of the amount of H plus and OH minus produced and hence how it affects your mole ratio. Okay, uh, next question 13. Group one element extraction method. Question mark, question mark. Which chapter? Think about it. Is it really about periodic table? It's actually not about periodic table. Why? It's because while we see group one, our heart wants to think, okay, alkaline metals. But the truth is that they're asking us about extraction. Okay, and what is about this extraction portion? 
we need to remember that actually what is actually being tested here is metals. So if you go all the way to the chapter in metals, okay, something that you want to note okay, is Totomatea here. Okay, under extraction of metals, what I need you to know is that for a metal that is more reactive, can you see here, right? The reactive metals like potassium, sodium, the extraction method I have to use is electrolysis. Meanwhile, if I'm less reactive, right, I'm a transition metal, I can do so with displacement with carbon. So the simple analogy that I always say is that a more reactive metal always form a more stable compound. Why? Uh? You think of your more reactive metal as like super handsome guys or girls, right? So when they form a compound, like they get together with somebody else, that relationship is very stable, very difficult to break. You need to electrocute them in order to separate them, right? So for more reactive metals, they form more stable compounds. Hence, we have to use a very extreme method like electrolysis for us to extract and break them apart. So if you go back to this question, rubidium is a group one element, same similar to potassium and sodium. So group one element, do you think it's going to be easy to extract it? Nah, it's going to be quite difficult. So we definitely have to be using electrolysis. The second part here is that consider both are electrolysis, but should we be dealing with an aqueous solution or a molten solution? Right? So what's the difference between aqueous and molten? In aqueous, we have water, the presence of H plus and OH minus. Okay? And we need to remember that between Rb plus and H plus, which one is easier to discharge? H plus will be preferentially discharged. So if you want to extract rubidium from rubidium chloride, if you use an aqueous solution, H plus will get discharged instead. So it's not a good method. So when we're doing electrolysis of a metal, to, to, in order to extract a metal, it will always be the molten compound, which is why the answer here is B. So it's not only about understanding electrolysis, you need to know which type of compound you're dealing with. Okay, so in summary, electrolysis should be always about the molten metal. Okay, the aqueous one, we'll come across it in just a moment. Okay, question 14, this is about QA, right? So when we add in aqueous ammonia, we get white precipitate which dissolves in excess. What does that signal us? If you go all the way back to your QA, right? So what should you be expecting? If you take a look at what dissolves in excess ammonia, is your zinc. So this is how you know that the compound we're dealing with here is zinc. Then barium nitrate, white precipitate. What is the identity of this white precipitate? It should be barium sulfate. Why? It's because barium sulfate is an insoluble salt. So the reason why we add in barium nitrate is because I want the barium to react with my sulfate to form an insoluble salt, which gives me this white precipitate. So if it really gives a white precipitate, it means sulfate is present answer should be zinc sulfate. So this is about Q8. Okay, recognizing what is being tested is just as important. Okay, question 15 here, we have a uh, aqueous solution, but wow, they're headache, right? Why? Because we add in two different things, right? We got Fe2 plus, Cl minus. We also got copper 2 plus and F minus. Most importantly, because it's an aqueous solution, I also have H plus and OH minus. Now, if you were to put all of this information together, what reaction will you be expecting at the end node? Remember, end node attracts N ions, right? So, okay, good. All the N ions are present. But between these three, which one gets to be discharged? So how do we decide? Okay, once again, we need to go back to our nodes and refer to this thing known as the ease of discharge series, right? So what does this ease of discharge do? It's kind of like your VIP customer list. You kind of decide um, who gets to get discharged first. So you take a look at your N ions for a dilute aqueous setup, OH- always wins. So OH- gets to be discharged. So between the three who wins, OH- wins. So the answer should be either A or D. Next, okay, uh, we are looking at the cathode between Fe, Cu, and H+. Who wins? We'll go back to the ease of discharge. Can you see? is arranged as per your reactivity series. But do you notice that copper is here, right? So copper ease of discharge is very high. That means it can easily get discharged compared to the rest, okay? So copper will get discharged. Hence, answer should be D. Okay, so this is for question 15. Next up, question 16. 
Here we have electrolysis. Okay, uh, what's inside the solution is sulfur acid. Take note, they're asking us which statement is false. Okay, hydrogen ions are discharged at a positive terminal. Why is this false? Hydrogen ions should be discharged at the negative terminal, right? Because H is H plasma, right? Positive be attracted to the negative terminal. So take note, okay? Understand the importance of recognizing which is your positive and negative based on the how it's being attached to the battery. Okay, uh, if not, okay, let's move on to question 17. So this one is already at acid and bases. So which reaction does dilute hydrochloric acid behave not like an acid? So in our head, right, you need to recognize that there are a total of three acid reactions. What are they? What are they? What are they? What are they? Okay, so they are, if you take a look, the three acid reactions are none other than acid metal, acid base, acid carbonate. If it's not this three, we don't consider it an acid reaction. So if you take a look at uh, A, okay, so you take a look at A, the, um, this is a neutralization, right? Acid plus alkaline, okay? Skip B, because uh, B is the answer. C is acid plus base. D is acid plus metal. Good, okay? So all these are all metal reactions. What, what about B? B is not. Can anybody identify what reaction this is? It's so nice. We got one, two, three participants. Sounds good. Okay. Answer here is that it's actually precipitation. Handwriting a bit ugly, but you kind of know how to spell it, right? Okay. So why is this precipitation? It's because we're adding soluble plus soluble to give us insoluble salt. Okay. So this is actually precipitation. Is it really behaving like an acid? No, because it did not undergo any acid reaction. So is B an actual reaction? Yes, but it's not behaving like an acid. Okay. Next, question 18. Okay. Uh, in question 18 here, we're dealing with this concept of equivalence point as well as indicators. So something I want you to note here is that if we're using a weak acid, notice the starting point is around pH 3. Because we are still using a strong alkaline, it is ending off at pH 13. So where is the midpoint between 13 and 3? It is around 9. So pH 9 is where it is fully neutralized. Take note, I know for us, we might be thinking, okay, acid base neutral is 7, right? But it's only true if it's between a strong acid and a strong alkaline. If I'm using a weak acid and a strong alkaline, my entire curve moves up my equivalence point increase as well, which means the point of neutralization, otherwise known as the equivalence point, would be higher at pH 9. So the moment we recognize, okay, my equivalence point is at pH 9, which indicator would be the most appropriate? It becomes very obvious here that phenolphthalein would be the correct choice. Why? It's because at pH 9, you will see a color change from colorless to pink. Okay, so for those of you that did the lab experiment, okay, phenolphthalein, right, colorless, you drip, 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 then it suddenly turn pale pink. This is the exact experiment that you're playing around with. Okay, so answer here should be phenolphthalein. Okay, um, question 19 here, this is a very complicated question if you do not know your stuff. Now, we add a salt, we warm it with sodium hydroxide, we get a gas that turn lit litmus paper blue. Quite obvious, this gas that we're dealing with is ammonia, right? Ammonia is the only one that can turn your litmus paper blue, okay? Now, there's no more. After we add excess, no more gas already, huh? we add aluminium powder. Then suddenly, we get gas Z, okay? So the question is, what is gas Z? So the first part that I need you to recognize here is that why would ammonia gas be produced, okay? The reason for that is because when we are dealing with something that has ammonium and we add alkaline, we should get salt plus water plus ammonia gas. If you are question mark, question mark, question mark, you're in trouble, okay? Because this is a very commonly tested equation. So if you're wondering what I'm talking about, this is the equation. Alkaline plus ammonium salt will give you salt plus water plus ammonia gas. Okay, if you are uh, listening in, okay, put an asterisk here, super important. Okay, go back to the question. So this salt contains ammonium upon warming with aqueous sodium hydroxide, which is an alkaline, 
it will give you a salt, water, and ammonia gas. This is the ammonia gas that turn your red litmus paper blue. Okay, next. No more gas produced, we add in aluminium powder. Then you're obviously asking, what is this aluminium powder? So to answer that question, okay, where is aluminium powder found? This will require you to go all the way back to QA. Okay, why QA? Pay special attention to the test for your nitrate. Okay, so why do we need to add aluminium when we are testing for nitrate? It's because your aluminium helps to reduce your NO3 minus to NH4. So aluminium here is functioning like a reducing agent. The moment you turn your NO3 to NH4, when you add in sodium, this would be the sodium plus ammonium reaction, therefore creating ammonia gas. So if you go back and you take a look here in the question, so the reason why we add in aluminium powder is because I want to change my nitrate into ammonium. Then once it changes from nitrate to ammonium, do you notice that there was the excess sodium hydroxide? So it further reacts with your alkaline to produce even more NH3. So what is gas Z? Gas Z is ammonia gas. What must your salt contain? It would contain ammonium and it will, should contain nitrate. Therefore, answer is A. Okay, this one is difficult. So if you didn't get this right, it's fine. But I think more importantly is recognizing that it contains two portions. Okay, an alkaline reaction followed by a, a QA sort of test for your anion. Okay, so this is to torture you a bit. I don't feel too bad if you get it wrong. Okay, uh, question 20, pretty straightforward. To prepare a spa salt, you should be using titration which is essentially a neutralization between an alkaline and an acid. D. Okay. Which process is endothermic? Okay. You need to know that melting and boiling are endothermic because energy is taken in to do what? To overcome your attract, uh, attractive forces. Right. So when energy is taken in, enthalpy change will increase. It's considered an endothermic reaction. Neutralization produced heat is an exothermic reaction. Displacement of less reactive metal from compound is endothermic. Thermal decomposition is, sorry, displacement of less reactive metal is exothermic. Thermal decomposition is endothermic. Okay. If you're not too sure which is which, right, what you would want to do is to go back to your notes, okay, uh, and take a look at it. So uh, if you don't have the curated notes, it's fine because your school notes should at least have some version of it, lah. But I think what's important here is you need to recognize that there are a few key exothermic reactions that you should know, like this. Okay, then for endothermic, there's also a couple that you want to look out for. Okay, so you see here that melting and boiling is endothermic, while condensation and freezing is exothermic. Okay, so answer here should be C. Okay, question 22, Haber process, our favorite. Okay, pretty straightforward, enthalpy change is negative. That means energy level of your system has decreased. Okay. Question 23, catalyst increased rate of reaction. That is true. But take note, increasing rate of reaction does not mean it increases the yield. Yield is the percentage that I produce per batch. Rate of reaction is the speed per unit time. Like how fast do I produce? Yield is how much do I produce each time. When we increase the rate of reaction, the U is not affected, okay? So if there's one thing I want you to take away here is that rate of reaction and U, they are different things, okay? Changing the temperature could affect the rate of reaction. It could affect the U as well. But when I increase rate of reaction, it doesn't mean I will impact the U. These two things are independent of each other, okay? So don't be too confused between the two. And I see this as a very common misconception. Okay, uh, not take a look at part three. Uh, catalyst help to lower the activation energy. Yes. Okay, catalyst only works for endothermic. No, catalyst work for all reaction. It just makes life easier for everyone. Okay, so A is true. Question 24. Here is about rusting, right? So there's only two things I'd like to highlight here. Okay, number one is what is the boiled water? What does boiled water do? Boiled water means I got rid of all oxygen which means the nail should not rust, okay? Because there's no more oxygen, no more air inside the water. The second thing is salty water. 
or sometimes they will write seawater. Okay, seawater will cause rusting to be the fastest. Okay, so with that, we need just need to know that rusting requires two conditions. It needs water, it needs oxygen. Okay, so which one will not rust? Okay, this one cannot rust. Why? Because no water. This one cannot rust because no oxygen. Number four will not rust because you have a protective layer of grease preventing the water and air from coming in contact with the nail. So cannot rust as well. Lastly, zinc. What's the importance of zinc? Zinc is a sacrificial metal. So it will react in place of the iron. So this one will not rust as well. Okay. Which one will rust? Number three will rust because it has all air and water. Which one will rust the fastest? Seawater. Therefore, answer here should be D. Okay, so why is salt water the fastest? Is because salt water contains mobile ions that will facilitate the rusting process. Do you need to know the exact explanation why? I'll say no. Okay, but you just need to know it speeds up the rate of reaction due to mobile ions. Okay, so if you're wondering the full explanation, uh, since we're talking about it, might as well show you. Okay, wait, wait, metals. Hopefully, nobody getting a headache from this scrolling. Give me a moment, rusting, rusting. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you can see that iron rusts faster in seawater due to the presence of ions in seawater that act as mobile charge carrier, facilitating the transfer of electron. Because rusting is theoretically iron turning into iron oxide. So, I want my iron to lose electrons. So, the mobile charge carriers will help with that. And C, we know that sodium chloride is dissolved inside seawater, so it helps make rusting faster. Okay, don't need to know the exact explanation. I've never seen it get tested before, but just know this. Okay, so question 25 is about the trends. Okay, which one is false? Reactivity should decrease down group seven. Pretty straightforward. These are the kind of questions you must get it right. Okay, question 26 this is about a reaction when we have mineral wool soaked in water, heating it up. What this means is that steam would be produced. Steam, metal, what gas do we produce? We should produce hydrogen gas. Okay, now is it copper or is it zinc? Okay, this one you need to go back and study your reactivity of metals. Okay, metal plus water, you will notice that for steam, right? The last metal that's able to react with steam is iron. Copper is below iron in the reactivity series. So if iron is the last one that could react with steam, it means that copper cannot react with steam because copper is a highly unreactive metal. So between copper and zinc, we should definitely choose zinc. Okay, so question 27. Uh, this is a hydrogen fuel cell. What's the overall equation? For hydrogen fuel cell, take note that it's always hydrogen and oxygen producing water. Okay, in the process, electricity is generated. Okay, so if you're not too sure how this works, okay, uh, you can definitely go back and revise it, okay? But I think you would need to know your hydrogen fuel cell to a certain extent, okay? Know it well. Okay, next, once again, we come across the periodic table, okay? Uh, a and C would form ionic compound, as we say, is between metal and non-metal. D is in group 7. We know that group 7 metals tend to be your F2, Cl2, Br2, you get it, okay? Diatomic is true, okay? Therefore, answer here should be B. Question 29, okay, this one's a bit of a trick question. Take note of the keyword here, ion, okay? Potassium is 2881. This is potassium. Potassium ion is 288. So how many electron shells does potassium ion have? It has three electron shells. So which one above have three electron shells? Those in the third period. So answer should be A, C, and D. If you chose B, it's because you did not pay attention to the term ion. Okay. Question 30. This is very straightforward, incorrectly matched. Okay. Carbon monoxide. Uh, carbon monoxide is not a greenhouse gas. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Okay. So don't be too confused between carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. They are different things. Okay. If not, let's take a look at question 31. This is about rate of reaction. Okay. So here in question 31, okay, what analysis are we able to make? Okay, these three statements are all true. Okay, um, if you take a look at the graph, like, real reaction is highest at the five seconds because the gradient is the steepest. 
fully used up after 40 seconds, true. Rate of reaction decreased after 15 seconds. Can see the gradient starts to get low, lesser and lesser. So rate of reaction decreased. Okay. Ammonium hydroxide is fully used up. Okay. The truth is that we do not know for certainty because in the question it says excess ammonium chloride. So excess actually likely means that it will not be fully used up. Why? It's because your sodium hydroxide here is the limiting reagent. It is the one that will actually be fully used up. Okay. Question 31, I know the natural inclination when you see such an equation, you'll be thinking, okay, oxidizing, reducing agent, confirm something like that. But the truth is that if you go and calculate the oxidation state here and the oxidation state here, VO4 3 minus, how should we calculate? X plus 4 minus 2. Why? Because O is 2 minus, that's 4 of it, gives a total charge of minus 3. X oxidation state is plus 5. Okay. For VO2, 2 plus, okay, X plus 2 minus 2 equals to plus 2. Okay, sorry, not plus 2, sorry. There's no 2 here. Plus 1. So you go and calculate the oxidation state here is still plus 5. So if down here V is plus 5, O, V here is also plus 5, what this means? It, mean, it meant that it did not undergo oxidation or reduction. So in no possible way, it will be an oxidizing or reducing agent. If you take a look at the equation, acid HH plus, right, produce something and water. So what this implies is that it's actually likely going to be acting like a base because base plus acid gives me salt plus water. So this is actually a neutralization reaction. So don't jump to conclusions. Try the question first. Apply your knowledge before you decide. Is it actually oxidizing or reducing agent? Don't assume just because the question looks familiar. Okay. For question 32, pretty straightforward. Just need to go and calculate your oxidation state. I think most of you should be able to do this quite confidently. So I won't need to go through this. Question 33, which one is not removed by your catalytic converter? Carbon dioxide is not removed. In fact, carbon monoxide was being converted into carbon dioxide. Okay, so carbon dioxide, is it, uh, why is it not removed? It's because carbon monoxide is highly, highly poisonous. So I really do not want this in my atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is still okay. Why? Because my plants can photosynthesis and get rid of it. So it's not the end of the world, but too much carbon dioxide will lead to greenhouse effect, which is kind of bad. Okay. Okay. Question 34. Take note once again, this is an electric cell. Okay. Which pair of metals will produce the greatest voltage? The further apart they are in the reactivity series, the greater the voltage. Okay. So silver and magnesium are the furthest apart. Okay, that's why it will give the greatest voltage. Which is true for all metals are uh, all. Okay, I'll tell you the exceptions. They all have um, high melting boiling point. Okay, do all metals exist in solid state at room temperature and pressure? There's one exception, mercury. Mercury exists as a liquid at room temperature. Okay, uh, other than that, all metals, they do conduct heat and electricity well. There are some unreactive metals like copper and silver that do not react with acid. So these two are not true. Okay, so that's the reason why answer here should be B. Okay, next question 36. We are coming to the end here, yeah? Okay, I see question 31 is repeated. Ah, okay, kind of get it. Okay, I'll look at the comments later. Uh, for question 36, okay, so this question is about percentage composition of air. So what if what we are dealing with here is 100 cm cube, you need to recognize that around 20% of air is actually made of oxygen. But this question is a little bit more unique. Why? This is a sample of air. So what this means is that this air might not necessarily have 20% oxygen. You cannot just assume that. Now, you take a look at the question, right? As we burn the air, it tells us that the volume of remaining gas is 75 cm cube. So between 100 and 75, what happened to that 25? This 25 is essentially your oxygen. Why? It's because your copper were reacted with your oxygen to form copper oxide. So if 25 cm cube of your air is oxygen out of 100 cm cube, that means the percentage of oxygen in your air is actually 25%. Clear? So the air, the air that disappears is oxygen. Nitrogen will not react. Okay. So 25% of it is actually oxygen here. 
Okay, question 37, this is about electrolysis once again, specifically under electroplating. So for electroplating, eh, sorry, sorry, this is not electrolysis. Sorry, if you take a look, if this is a light bulb, what does it mean? It means it's an electric cell. Sorry. Jump to conclusion. See, that is bad. Okay, so this electric cell setup, okay, what will happen is that your more reactive metal will always dissolve. So your Fe here turns into Fe2+. So it dissolves into the solution, generating an electron flow. That's how your bulb lights up. Okay, so you expect your iron nail to decrease in size. Your more reactive metal will always dissolve and get smaller in size. Okay, which is true for all exothermic reactions. Okay, B bond breaking must always be lesser than bond forming. So I always tell my, tell my students BB minus BF, right? So if you want exothermic reactions, it means your enthalpy change is negative. So you need BF to be bigger than BB. Right, so that you'll get a negative value, which is an exothermic reaction. Clear? Okay, 39, this is about enthalpy change. Which value should we be looking at? 116 here, this is our activation energy. Enthalpy change is always between start point and end point, so you should be using 2 to 5. Okay, positive or negative, you see that it actually went down. So it should be negative 2 to 5. Okay, and lastly, question 40, this is about bond energy. We have N23H2 to give you 2NH3. So how should we solve this question? Okay, you need to take a closer look. N would form a triple bond N. H is a single bond H. NH3 would be drawn like that. So you need to calculate total bond breaking minus total bond forming to give you enthalpy change. The question told us that the enthalpy change is negative 92. Okay. Meanwhile, with 945, nine, that is bond breaking. What else do we break? We also break the HH bond. But take note, there's three of it. So we need to do three times X. What do we minus? We minus bond forming. How many of this? There's two of ammonia. Each ammonia has three NH bonds, right? So we need to do two, because there's two of it, three times the NH bond here, which is 390. Then you solve for X, like a math student. Okay, so with that, you should be able to get 434. Okay, and with that, I think um, we have come to the end of the MCQ explanation. Okay, uh, so here, right now, the time is around 625. We'll take a short five-minute break because I need to go to the toilet as well. Then after this five minute break, we'll come back and we'll go through paper two. Okay, so everybody go take a shot. Okay, let's take a look at the paper two together. So paper two here, this paper, um, if we do a quick browse through, I think it's a pretty straightforward one with a lot of the key concepts that I predict would be likely to appear at O level. I've included it in here. Uh, you notice that the kind of questions that are being set here, I think is very specific to um, how O level is trending towards especially for questions like question seven, you'll notice that you might not have seen the word brine before, but you see in a very familiar context in a form of uh, electrolysis setup. So you kind of need to be prepared that questions similar to this will appear. In fact, it's getting more and more convoluted. What do I mean by that? You're being introduced to things that you might not have heard before, uh, things that might be covered at A levels, but they are testing you at the context of O level. So section B questions, you need to do more practices, more prelim papers, and that will greatly help you uh, be gain the exposure that is needed okay, to do well at your, your O level itself. Okay, So now let's start with question one. Okay, Very common, you'll see questions like this, which spans across multiple topics. Okay, So forming due to high temperature is your nitrogen dioxide. Okay, Here you need to choose an amphoteric oxide, it's either zinc, aluminum, or lead, okay, but only zinc is available, so you choose zinc. Okay. So here, white precipitate of when adding in silver, you need to know that the white precipitate here when we are trying to form is silver chloride, which is why if you add in silver nitrate, you already have the silver, you need something with the chloride. Okay. Next, uh, prepared via titration. Titration is always preparing spa salts, so sodium nitrate. Acid carbonate reaction. Moist red litmus paper turn blue when added to ammonium nitrate. This is your ammonium salt plus alkaline reaction. Okay, so these are all free marks, but it requires knowledge from multiple topics. So make sure you uh, you're well prepared for this. Okay.
the answers are in the Telegram channel for now. Uh, tomorrow, when I have time, I'll upload it onto the website. Okay. Question two, this is about the blast furnace. You need to know your hematite is your iron three oxide. Okay. For those of you who are struggling with blast furnace, okay, I think it's likely because you are just memorizing it. Okay. So maybe just give me a moment here. Give me two minutes. I'll try to explain blast funnels as best as I can. Okay. For blast funnels, I would obviously um, I mean it's easier as a teacher to say, oh, just memorize blast funnels. But the truth is that if you understand how and why you add in certain things, everything will make a lot more sense. Okay. So the first step in the blast funnels is that I want to generate as much carbon dioxide as possible. Okay. Carbon dioxide in the air is very little, it's not sufficient. So I need to mass produce carbon dioxide. How am I able to achieve that? my coke or my carbon would burn in air to produce carbon dioxide, okay? Furthermore, my limestone would decompose, okay, to produce carbon dioxide as well. But why is it that I need this carbon dioxide? It's because I need to convert the carbon dioxide and further reduce it to turn into carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is the main star here. Why? It's because carbon monoxide is responsible for reducing your Fe2O3 into Fe, right? The process of extraction is that my iron ore, my iron tree oxide is useless. I cannot do anything with it, right? Minecraft, you go and mine, you get the ore, you don't stop there. What? You need to go and uh, furnace it to get the pure metal. So the pure metal is what we want, okay? But how do we get there? We need to extract it. How? Via reduction with carbon monoxide. So the first three steps actually all help to build carbon monoxide, which is then used to extract your iron, okay? Then you'll notice here there's a remaining CaO. This CaO has an additional function of getting rid of, remember, silicon dioxide, getting rid of your sand here to form slick. So these are your five reactions. This is a must know, right? But it's broken up into four main phases, okay? That's uh, how we should be approaching your um, blast furnace, okay? So I won't go through the reactions here because you can find it in your textbook, curated notes, or even the free notes online. Uh, but I think more importantly, my final advice to you is by now, if you're taking O-level, you should know the equations by heart. Okay, very important. Okay, so identify the reducing agent. The reducing agent is the carbon monoxide. Why? It's because it caused your iron oxide to be reduced from plus three to zero in Fe. So I think this is something that I like to emphasize as well. It's important for you to identify the reducing agent and justify it by saying that it costs something else to reduce. So the mission of a reducing agent is to reduce somebody else. And you need to show that it really reduced somebody else by talking about how the oxidation state has changed. Okay, lastly, calcium oxide is basic because it's a metal oxide. Non-metal oxide in silicon dioxide is acidic, which is why this is a basic plus acidic oxide reaction. Okay, so just a note. Okay, so this is something that you might want to take note of. Okay, question three, this is Haber process and most of the time it's tied in with uh, rate of reaction. So why is higher pressure better for higher rate of reaction? It's because here the particles are brought closer together. Take note, this is all about keywords. When you're required to explain rate of reaction, you need to recognize that the keywords are what will be the examiner will be looking out for. So when reactants are brought closer together, more particles per unit volume, frequency of collision increase, frequency of effective collision increase. Therefore, your rate of reaction will increase. Okay, so when you're studying rate of reaction, make sure you get your keywords right. Okay, now, if we take a look at the graph, you notice that when temperature increases, right, from 350 to 5, can you see the U is decreasing? So the question is, why is it that I'm using 450 degrees Celsius instead of 350 degrees Celsius. Wouldn't 350 give me higher yield compared to 450? So why is it that I'm using 450? Okay, the reason is because it is more cost efficient. Okay, because higher temperature means higher rate of reaction. So it's important to say that it's more cost efficient because higher temperature leads to increasing rate of reaction. So even though I get a lower yield, it's fine because I'm producing a lot faster, okay? So this is the concept behind Haber process, okay? Then drawing your energy profile diagram, some important things, label your axis, okay? Uh, you want to draw in, label your activation energy, label enthalpy change, 
it would be great if you can write in your reactants here and you write in your products here. Okay, that's the gold standard. Lah. Okay, then uh, obviously draw with catalyst and without catalyst. Okay, without catalyst, you need to climb Mount Everest. With catalyst, you climb Bukit Timah Hill. So with catalyst, obviously life is a lot easier. Okay, next acid rain. Okay, take note that acid rain is not only about dissolving in water, but in oxygen as well producing two of your common acid in the form of sulfuric acid as well as nitric acid. Two negative effects, just go and study. How to reduce acidity can go and study as well, but generally we add in calcium hydroxide, which is an alkaline, or we can add in limestone because acid carbonate reaction. Okay, So if I want to keep things at pH 7, which one will be better? Do I use an alkaline or do I use a carbonate? Carbonate will be better, because carbonate will not cause the pH to increase further, even if I add it in excess. But if I add in excess alkaline, what happens? The pH might shoot up, right? It might go into the very alkaline range. And then that's not good for our plants. Okay. So if you want to maintain it at seven, then the better choice would be calcium carbonate. Okay. But sometimes the acid is very deeply seeped into the soil, right? Calcium carbonate is a solid, so it only can neutralize the acid on the surface. But alkaline is different. Alkaline can seep into the soil because it's soluble. So alkaline is also good. It's a pros and cons thing. It really depends on the situation. Okay. Um, this one is a classic. So if you want to, you can put the asterisk here. But okay, what is going on here is ammonium chloride, ammonium salt plus alkaline. So what's the issue if I add in the fertilizer with ammonium and I add in alkaline at the same time? The ammonium salt will react with the alkaline to form ammonia gas. This is the worst case scenario. Why? Not only do your plants not get to absorb the nitrogen because it's escaping in the form of ammonia, your alkaline is also reacted away. So your alkaline doesn't help you to get rid of the acid. Instead, it just reacts with the fertilizer. So your entire farm just becomes damn smelly because it's a bunch of ammonia and your plants do not get anything. So this is the worst case scenario. Okay, And this is quite commonly tested, so you might want to be careful. All right? Um, lastly, okay, you need to know your reactions in your catalytic converter. Okay, if not, moving on to the ionic versions of manganese. Okay, so once again, learning how to calculate your oxidation state, I think is super important. Uh, talk about whether it has undergone oxidation or reduction. Same thing, talk about the change in oxidation state. 2 plus in this to 4 plus in this. Okay, don't just say change from 2 plus to 4 plus. That's an incomplete answer. You want to say 2 plus in what compound to 4 plus in what compound. Okay, so make your answer complete. Okay, for oxidation states, I think this one, you should be okay with the calculation. This is similar to the one that I did earlier with the X, so on and so forth. Okay, identifying oxidizing agent, chlorine, because chlorine caused this guy to oxidize from plus 2 to plus 6 in this. Okay, take note that the oxidizing agent itself will always undergo reduction. So in order to oxidize somebody else, I myself have to be reduced, right? So that is my mission. I oxidize somebody else, I get reduced in the process, okay? So that's how we identify an oxidizing agent. Next, question six, this is purely about QA, okay? So how do we start? The easiest way to break this down is you take a look at B, magnesium. This colorless solution with magnesium cause a gas to be produced that can extinguish a lighter spin. Straight away, this is hydrogen gas. Metal hydrogen gas. What plus metal gives you hydrogen gas? You know that this dude is an acid. Okay, next, move on. Colorless gas, bubble, lime water, white PPT. Wow, straight away, you know this one is our favorite carbon dioxide. Okay, so I want you all to note that, okay, at least in part B here, you all can notice this is the reaction between carbon dioxide, lime water, and your white PPT is actually calcium carbonate. You all see it? Okay. So when you bubble your carbon dioxide into your lime water, you'll get a white precipitate because calcium carbonate is your white PPT. Okay, so what you have done here is you already answered carbon dioxide and E is your calcium carbonate. Okay, now acid plus something gives you carbon dioxide. It's like, uh, what reaction is this? This is acid plus carbonate. So you already know that this is carbonate, but I don't know what carbonate yet. Okay, now let's take a look here. You get salt plus water and you get a gas, that's fine. So what is in this salt? Okay, When you add in barium nitrate, you get a white PPT. Barium something white PPT, question mark, question mark, question mark, right? 
This under QA already. When you add in barium and you get white precipitate, it's because you form an insoluble barium sulfate salt. That is your white PPT here. So barium sulfate salt. Okay, now here, excess aqueous ammonia, I get a white PPT. What does it mean? Okay, it means that this should be either aluminium or lead. So this is back to QA. If you're not too sure why, go back to your QA under weak alkaline aqueous ammonia. There's only two that give you insoluble and excess, okay, which is aluminium and lead. Okay, now, so if this colorless solution originally had sulfate, what does this make this acid? This acid has to be sulfuric acid. Now, here, the question is, should this be aluminium sulfate or should this be lead sulfate? Lead sulfate cannot be the answer. Why? It's because this is a colorless liquid. Lead sulfate is an insoluble salt. You see it? So in that case, we eliminate lead, leaving only aluminium to be the only choice, which means here I'm playing around with aluminium carbonate. My colorless liquid here is aluminium sulfate. Also, an aluminium uh, sulfate, then G is an aluminium hydroxide. Okay, this is how I get my full seven marks for QA. So, if you ever get a QA question, start with the easiest part. You don't have to follow a certain flow. You see, I jump from here to here, but I think at the end of the day, it's putting bits and pieces of information together such that it makes sense to you. Okay, and solve. Even if you can't solve the full thing, at least secure the marks that you can, like this side and this side. Then you maybe make a guess on what the remaining ones are. Okay. Um, yeah, then part C, I think you can go and read through by yourself. Ionic equation for precipitation. Okay. Uh, next, this is the one that I talked about earlier. Okay, the more complicated question, right? Electrolysis of brine. So what's the situation here? Okay. Okay, why G cannot be zinc is because zinc would dissolve in excess um, aqueous ammonia. Okay, so that's the reason. Now, um, so brine is actually made of concentrated sodium chloride. Okay. So it allows sodium hydroxide and chlorine gas to be produced. So this kind, right, you need to take a moment to go and analyze it, okay? So brine is concentrated sodium chloride. The membrane only allows particles that are small to pass through. Big particles, okay, and doesn't allow negatively charged particles like OH- and Cl- to pass through. So let's first take a look on the left side, okay? Titanium anode, okay? We put in brine. So what ions are present on the left side? There's Na+, plus, Cl-, minus, H+, plus, and OH-. Minus because brine, which is concentrated sodium chloride, is added. Okay. What about on the other side? On the other side, take note, only Na+, plus and H2O can pass through. So on the other side, I only have Na+, plus, H+, plus, and OH-. Minus. Cl- minus is left behind. Okay. Now, part B, they ask us to state the explanation for reactions with the aid of ionic half equation. The titanium anode is connected to the positive terminal. It forms the anode. So we need to remember that anode is always oxidation. What has oxidized here is your anion Cl- minus getting oxidized to Cl2. If you're wondering, hey, Cher, isn't it supposed to be OH- minus instead of Cl-? Minus? This is where you need to remember that we are dealing with a concentrated solution. Okay, For concentrated solution, the choice of who gets discharged is different because now we have to think about concentration effect. Okay, So for a concentrated setup here, you can see that between Cl- and OH-, Cl- is discharged due to concentration effect. You can see? So between the battle between the two, okay, Cl- will get discharged. If you're wondering how that works, you can always go back to the ease of discharge, okay, between the dilute and between the concentrated. You'll see that now OH- get pushed back. Cl- is easier to discharge, okay? That's the reason why Cl- gets discharged as chlorine gas. Meanwhile, at your cathode, okay, reduction occurs for your hydrogen turning into hydrogen gas, okay? So this is the reason why you get chlorine gas here and hydrogen gas here. Okay, next, okay, if you take a look at uh, why is it important that we only allow OH- and Cl- okay, uh, to, to not allow them to pass through, is because if we allow OH- to pass through to the left side, okay, it would be discharged and oxygen gas would be produced instead. 
So what we mean is that we know that on this side, there's OH minus, but we don't want the OH minus to go through. Why? It's because here I want my Cl minus to be produced, to be discharged, sorry. But if I allow OH minus to go over, right, it disrupts the entire system here because I want to keep the solution here concentrated. So chlorine will be discharged. But if I allow OH minus to go back, then it becomes a dilute setup and that's going to be bad. Okay. Uh, they will reduce the amount of chlorine produced. Okay. So similarly, if chlorine is allowed to pass through on the other side, it will actually react with Na+, plus, resulting in the impure mixture of sodium chloride and sodium hydroxide. So objectively, if you are an engineer and you're building this system, right, you want to remember that I want chlorine gas, I want hydrogen gas, and I want sodium hydroxide. See, if I allow my um, Cl- minus to come over, instead of sodium hydroxide, which is NaOH, which is very useful since it's an alkaline, I will form NaCl. NaCl is useless. I don't need it. I got plenty of it in the seawater, right? So I don't really want that. So that's the reason why we cannot allow Cl to come over, okay? If at this point, you're still a little bit perplexed on how this whole thing works, I highly suggest you can take some time after this session to read through this question again. This is not an easy question, but at the same time, I think there are a lot of important learning points that you can take away, all right? In the interest of time, let's move on to question eight, which is about titration, okay? So filling in your value shouldn't be a problem. Take note, when you're required to find average volume, the best practice for titration is to use the average of your two closest value. In this case, 1.79, 1.79, 1.7, 17.9. Yes, that's why we use 17.9. You calculate concentration using your more concept framework, okay, which is the four steps. Okay? So here, luckily, the question already gave us the equation. So all you have to do is to use the 17.9 to calculate more. You compare more ratio then you find the concentration of this unknown uh, XOH alkaline solution. Okay, Next, they tell us that the concentration of it in grams per dm cube is 13.26. So you can take mass over mole. This is your mole here. This is your mass. Okay, You'll get 74. So XOH is a MR of 74. That means X itself is calcium. Okay. Lastly, why should we not use titration to prepare X SO4 is because if this is calcium sulfate, calcium sulfate is a insoluble salt and it should be prepared using precipitation instead. So understanding your three salt preparation method and when to use which method is really at the core of understanding salt preparation in detail. All right. Lastly, question nine. Okay, there's either or. We'll go through both. For either, I'll keep it straightforward. Remember, the box itself is your working. So in the exam, you have to write out a box with mass mr mole mole ratio. Okay, Half equations, you'll notice that the electrons here are different. So how do we combine the half equations to form a chemical equation? It's by balancing out the electrons. So you see what I did to the first equation is I times 2 to the first equation. So that now I got 4 electrons, 4 electrons. I can cancel them out. Okay, what do I do next is to combine all my reactants together and all my products together. So my reactant includes Fe, O2, H2O. My product is Fe2 plus and OH minus. Take note, since we are using a chemical equation, I cannot have it in ionic form. So when I combine my iron and my hydroxide, it forms a compound, which is why your full chemical equation is as such. Okay. More reactive metal displacing less reactive metal, displacement reaction. Once again, explaining why something has been reduced. Okay, you explain because Fe here lost oxygen. Because they ask you to specifically explain it in terms of gain or loss of oxygen. So you should not be talking about oxidation state. You should be purely discussing oxygen. Okay. Uh, lastly, this one is about the extraction. We talked about this earlier, right? More reactive metal, you need to use electrolysis while the slightly less reactive transition metal can be extracted via heating with carbon. Okay, so that is what goes into your explanation. Okay, uh, can you say that 9C is a redox reaction? Yes, you can. I think that's fine. There's a, I think that's a very relevant point. So if you write redox here, I think that's cool too. Okay, in fact, all displacement reactions are redox reactions. Okay, thank you. For question 9, okay, dot and cross diagram, this should be fine. Group 5, group 7, share one pair of electrons. Whether high or low melting boiling point, okay, definitely low because we're dealing with a simple molecular structure with 
weak intermolecular forces of attraction. So for chemical bonding, if you're revising it, take note, keywords is super important. Okay, aluminium chloride, why is this weird? Okay, it's because metal and non-metal should be ionic bond. But instead, what you see here is a covalent bond. That's why it's unconventional, right? Um, if not, if you were to draw it out properly, this is how it should look. Okay, and lastly, how do we prepare aluminium chloride? Take note that this is a soluble salt, okay? So what we have to do here is to react an acid, okay, with the metal, right? Then you go through your, your steps, okay? Name it out one by one, filter, um, heat due saturation for your filtrate, wash with cold distilled water, dry between sheets of filter paper, okay? So I think that that is how it works, okay? Can you write van der Waals instead of intermolecular forces of attraction? You can, but uh, I think van der Waals um, a bit harder to spell. Lah. So I personally like to write intermolecular forces of attraction. Okay. I think with that, we come to the end of the paper two review. Okay. So to finish off the session, I said that I'll also share more about um, your CLT, your common last topic removal and working towards O level. So what are certain things that I want you all to take note of? Okay. So if at this point in time, if you're in SEC 4 or SEC 5, taking O-level in six to seven weeks, okay, I think the priority is to ensure that you understand your concepts and you get your facts right. I think this is so important, right? So a lot of times you rush into practices. We want to do our TYS. We want to do our uh, tenure series. Then we want to do prelim paper, right? But then your whatever you understand is not correct or is only partial understanding. Then when you do the questions, you realize that there's a lot of questions you cannot do. So I think the priority is still getting your facts right. So you want to understand your concepts properly so that when you attend the questions, right, then that's when you actually get the proper uh, regurgitation of how a question could be set. So it's always a concept first, then understanding how the concept could be tested in the form of a question. So during September, if you already know your content well, I think use the prelim papers and your TYS to help you sift through what are your weaker topics then go back and revise those content, okay? And take note of what your weaker topics are and then try more practices for those. I think something that's very important, right, is that at this point, you might be thinking you want to clock a 10 to 12 hour revision schedule. But I think what's important here is you need to make sure that your practice and your revision is effective. So what do I mean by that? If your goal today is to revise electrolysis, right? After you revise it, go and attempt the practices. After you're done with the whole thing, right? Close your book, okay? Test yourself, okay? Ask yourself questions and see if you're able to answer them. If you are stuck or you're not too certain, that means you should go back and to revise it, okay? If you're not too good with testing yourself, find a study buddy, test each other, right? Quiz each other questions like, okay, if I do electrolysis for a dilute sodium chloride, what happens at a cathode, right? Then that's when you start thinking. And if you're able to recall it correctly and even explain it to your friend, that means you truly know your stuff. Okay, so make sure you get this tree layering, right? Because if you just jump to practice without understanding your concept, it will be tough for you to do well, all right? Okay, next, um, removal of CLT, right? So we want to understand the impact of this, okay? I know it's a very good thing because here we don't have to be bothered about organic chem, okay? And the fact that now our practical will not have any organic chem uh, analysis. So I think overall, it makes the life a lot easier. Okay, but the first thing I need you to recognize is what is the impact of it? So do you all know how, what is the weightage for your paper one MCQ? So 40 MCQ questions, right? What is the overall weightage for it? Okay, it's actually 30% of your grade. Okay, so paper two is 50% of your grade. Now, think about paper one alone. Previously, 40 questions is worth 30%. On average, per question is around 0 0.75 marks. Okay. Now, because organic chem is removed, the remaining questions, the remaining 34 or 35 questions that you're required to answer, the weightage is even more heavy. It's nearing almost every single question is almost one mark. So let's say you really, after your paper two, you completely let go. You don't care about your MCQ at all. You just go party, right? Then you ignore your MCQ. And then when you take your MCQ, you make mistakes here and there. What's the impact of it? You notice now, before, when you get one question wrong, it's only 0 0.75. Now you get one question wrong, it's almost one mark. So that means if you make five MCQ mistakes, right? You're dropping from your A1 to A2, A2 to B3. So removing CLT is a double-edged sword. Why? It's because now the remaining chapters become so much more important. 
right? Previously, maybe you have a bit of buffer. You got some organic time questions to help you out. But now the remaining questions are the weightage is even more and that makes it even more so important for you to master those topics. So while you have less to memorize now or less to study now, you have a lot more um, pressure on you to make sure you get those chapters right. Okay, so I don't know whether this is going to be a trend or not, but last year, at least feedback from your seniors, okay, or from my own students themselves, uh, what they have told me is that strangely, the paper seems a bit more difficult and they in fact struggle a bit more to complete the paper on time. I don't know whether it was just a one-off thing in 2020 or is it going to be a recurring trend, but I want you to be amply prepared that removing organic chem doesn't mean life gets easier, okay? So understand what that means, okay, and you want to double down on your remaining subjects. Okay, so uh, for those of you which are unfamiliar with uh, what we do here at Overmark, uh, mainly we try to help you out. And if you feel like you need an in-depth revision for all your content, I think the crash courses is a good place for you to start. I think to date, we have really uh, enjoyed hosting these crash courses with a lot of students. So we have over 300 plus students that join us uh, since July. Uh, we have a couple more sessions in September. Some of it is quite going to be booked quite soon, lah, like quite full already. So for the 18th September one for chemistry, I think there's only 10 slots left. So if you're keen, you might want to sign up fast. Uh, we also have a couple others for our different subjects. Uh, if they interest you, uh, do go and sign up directly on the website. Just note that if you sign up with a friend, just put both your name and your friend's name in the promo code section and it'll give you 10% off. Okay. For those of you that are wondering uh, what was I referring to, I was just referring to the curated notes. So if you're interested, you definitely could purchase a copy of this. Uh, the order form is in our Instagram uh, bio. So you can easily click through it or you can go onto our website to order it. So what's inside the booklet is, as you see, is the notes as well as some examples, as well as exam pointers. So if you find that it might be something that you will need, okay, do give it a consideration, okay? But if your school notes are sufficient, you know, uh, you can just use your school notes, okay? If not, I think I come to the end, I'll have a short Q&A section here, okay? So for anybody that are keen, okay, uh, please let me know. Okay, uh, sometimes we do, do give away for our curated notes. Okay, that's why maybe some of your classmates uh, managed to get it for free. So congrats to the winner. Okay, um, so anybody that are curious or you have any questions, you can type it in the chat. Uh, I'll, have, I'll do a basic Q&A for the next five minutes. Okay. It doesn't have to be related to the paper. It could be any generic chemistry questions or even studying related tips or pointers. Okay, so first question. Best way to revise chemistry chapters. Uh, I think a good way that would work um, that I advise a lot of my own students to do is to group similar chapters together, which means when they revise, they revise acid bases, salts, and QA collectively as one big chapter. Because you need to realize that chemistry is quite different from math or um, like even for physics, right? Because the question the chapters are very independent from one another, but that's not the case for chemistry, right? We understand that rate of reaction is incorporated into how we study Haber process. We understand that when we are doing chemical bonding, it requires knowledge from atomic structure as well. So when you're trying to study chapters for chemistry, try to study as a cluster rather than studying them independently. Then I think it will be a lot better. For tougher content-heavy chapters like chem bonding, metals, and air, what you want to do here is remember your keywords and you can even do a mind map or summary table. That would help, okay? So for 9C, can I write aluminium does not have a full valence electron shell even after bonding? Um, I'm not too sure what you mean. I think the question was about why is it unconvectional, right? I think the best way is still to answer via uh, whether it's supposed to be ionic bond or covalent bond, okay? If you're required to do the forward and backward reaction, how do you draw it? Okay, because Haber process is a reversible reaction, okay, uh, you can flip it around. You just need to change your reactants and your products. It turns from exo to endo. Okay, I don't know whether the question will require you to draw on the same diagram, uh, but usually what we draw is the forward reaction, okay, unless they require you to draw the backward. For energy diagrams, it is best to use one headed arrow. Uh, for enthalpy change, it should be one headed. Okay, for, for activation energy, you can draw two headed, that's fine. But if you want to draw a single head, that makes sense too. Any tips for chemical practical? Uh, yes, uh, 
you would need to understand what are the common topics that could be tested for practical. That includes sort preparation, separation technique, more calculation, so on and so forth. You will need a lot of knowledge of the chapter in order to do well for practical. So practical, I know you'll be concerned with the table, how many SM, what equipment to use, what's the precision and things like that. But don't forget that if you understand how the reaction work, the whole experiment makes more sense. So if you want to do well for a practical assessment that involves QA, you kind of need to know your QA well. Even though they provide you with the table, it helps to go in with a strong foundation. So revising practical also means revising chapters related to, highly related to practical. Okay. So why is calcium carbonate used? Like some questions ask how many gas can be treated by calcium carbonate. Um, acidic gases could be treated with calcium carbonate because acidic gases are acidic, they can react with carbonate. Okay. How to manage time in practical? Read the question carefully, but do not be overly careful. That is one issue that I face for myself. When I'm doing my practical, I became too careful and then I do too slow. So just remember, if you're drawing your table and you're writing your values and stuff, right? It's actually smarter to write your first value in pencil. Okay. In case not say to cheat, but in case you need to adjust your value or to re- do the experiment, you don't have to correction tape and stuff. So those are some smaller tips that I want you to be aware of. If you're unsure, write it in pencil first. Then once you're confirmed, then you write your uh, un answer in pen. Okay. Take note, don't spend too much time on your actual experiment such that it leaves you no time to write the theory portion where they require you to answer questions. That one is where a lot of marks are at as well. Okay, any tips on where to get other school prelim papers? If your school doesn't provide you with sufficient, you can easily go online to find. If you can't, uh, usually where I go to is I go to opposite National Library Board. There's this entire building that sells a lot of brilliant papers. Okay. Uh, if all metals have high boiling boiling point, why is mercury liquid? So we need to recognize that most metals have high melting boiling point. Okay. Uh, there's a few exceptions to the rule of course, uh, alkaline metals and mercury. So the keyword here is most metals, not all metals. Okay. Which reaction produce uh, nitrogen? dioxide, a uh, nitrogen reaction with oxygen would produce nitrogen dioxide. You can find it in the chapter for air and atmosphere, okay? Production of nitrogenous oxides. Okay, uh, why is it that we cannot have lead carbonate instead of aluminium? It's because lead sulfate is an insoluble salt, so it will not form a liquid, okay? If you look, at, look back at the table, you should know why I mean, okay? Okay, last few questions, huh? How do you effectively revise content apart from textbook, notes, active recall? Is it too late? Okay. Is it too late? I'll be honest. It's not the best time to start now, right? It should have started way earlier. But at this point in time, if you're wondering, is it too late? That's not the question you should be wondering. The question is, how much are you able to cover with the remaining time? I always tell my students, a determined student with a set plan and goal can achieve a lot. Are you able to from fail jump to A1? I say, let's be realistic, okay? Set goals that are possible. But if you have the determination and you have a plan and you execute the plan well, a lot can happen, okay? So uh, apart from textbook, doing notes, I think do practices, right? If you already get your content grounded, the practices will help a lot, okay? Uh, let's take a look next. How to know carbon double bond or carbon single bond? You think about the covalent bond that you're forming here, right? So how many do they need to share to get a fully filled valence shell, right? That's how you determine how many sets of electrons they share. That's how you know whether it's a double, single, or even a triple bond. Okay. Um, I'll try to answer the rest that are a bit more generic, okay? Was this set easy, difficult, or average? Uh, this is definitely slightly more difficult than O-level, uh, closer to a brilliant standard paper. Okay. Uh, if not, I think I answered most of your questions. Okay. A uh, simple electric cell, when does the bulb light up? The bulb lights up when there's electron flowing through the circuit. Okay. But I think if not, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this session. I hope it has been helpful. Uh, I think it was quite fun to do this uh, mock paper as well. Just note that, you know, other than this session, this is the first one. Later on, after dinner, there's EMAT. And for the rest of the week, there's also the other subjects, okay? I'll be doing for physics as well. So if you take physics and you're interested in having a similar session, do attend that as well. 
But I think most importantly, I hope that using this September holiday uh, to make it more productive and to really prepare you. Uh, for the set trees that are in the chat, I hope that this session, while some of the topics covered might be a bit out of your syllabus right now because you haven't done them, I hope that it was useful as well. And for set trees, if you're keen, okay, uh, I always uh, let everybody know that I'm also uh, open and having group tuition sessions for set three. So if you're in set three and you're interested to be taught by me, okay, just reach out to me, right, on IG or on Telegram. And I think most importantly for the set fours, all the best, okay, I really hope that you all get the grade that you want. And no worries, I'll upload this uh, explanation session, everything on YouTube, but give me some time, okay? If not, that's all. So thank you everyone for joining. That's it. Go have your dinner, okay? There's EMF session later on. So if you're interested, please join that.